morning. Welcome to our uh, second service here at the First Colony Church of Christ. So glad, to, so glad to have you with us and to our online worshipers, we welcome you uh, as well. Hey, uh, today's a pretty good day to be an Astros fan, right? Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, yesterday was a pretty good day for a lot of teams that were wearing orange. And so it's just a, yeah. So uh, I encourage you to regularly check in with our church website, firstcolonychurch.org, uh, so you can stay up to date as to what's going on in the life of our church family, because a lot of really, really good things are going on. And I know that uh, several of you uh, enjoyed the uh, women's retreat, and thanks to uh, Missy Edgman and her team, we put together just a a uh, great event. Yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know Martha was there, and she came back last night and just giving rave reviews for the weekend. Um, well, we're in a message series called Rediscover Church, and as we're kind of following a book by that uh, title. And um, today's uh, chapter is on the topic of, of church discipline. You say, oh, oh, joy, I'm so glad I'm here for a message on the topic of church discipline. But listen, you know, discipline is so vitally important to any group. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, I mean, a football game has to have discipline, has to have boundaries to it, and those boundaries need to be enforced. The National Football League has boundaries, and they have people who are charged to enforce those, those boundaries. A family has to have discipline. In fact, the Bible will say that a lack of discipline in a family is really a, a lack of love. My parents absolutely loved me. I know that they loved me. They told me that they loved me, and they demonstrated their love for me in so many good ways. They were kind. They were generous. Uh, but we also had a number of uh, MLEs as I was growing up, meaningful learning experiences. That's what an MLE is. And, uh, and they would provide uh, guardrails and, and boundaries and the discipline as it was uh, appropriate. You know, one of the better known statements in the Bible is that uh, statement where Cain was asked about his brother. And he said, am I my brother's keeper? I don't really want to be bothered by my brother. But the Bible says, not so fast, my friend. You're not to be your brother's critic or your sister's critic or a holy meddler, but we are to be our brother and sister's keeper and helper. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 says, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. In other words, we do have an enemy. And that enemy seeks to lure believers away from the paths of righteousness. There is an evil one and his force seeking to undermine the work of the Holy Spirit at every turn. And so sometimes a believer might begin to minimize sin. Or they get discouraged and they give in to despair. Or they lose sight of who they're serving and why they're, ser and why they're serving. Sometimes they just get so caught up in worldly things. Money, pleasure, work, or even just their kids' activities. No time is left for God. Some brothers or sisters just might become angry and bitter. And they allow their anger and bitterness to draw them away from God. And the Bible says to those of us who have a bent towards spirituality. We must, and it's important, to take seriously the call to watch over one another, to encourage one another, and yes, even to admonish one another. The Bible just sort of assumes that we will care and we will speak the truth to one another when that's needed, that that will simply be standard operating procedure. Again, not being a police person to one another, writing tickets, not a critic, but a helper. Second Thessalonians 3 says this, 
Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter and do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed and yet do not regard them as an enemy but warn them as you would a fellow believer. There are times and appropriate times when perhaps in the lives of believers you might need to look at me and say, Ronnie, we don't need to pretend that everything is well. It's not. Some of you are familiar with neighborhood watch groups, and you've seen those signs in a neighborhood. And a church is a neighborhood watch group in a good way. So even in 2022, churches need good muscle tone. Churches need to have a little teeth. And so when we, when we talk about discipline, there are two types. One is formative discipline, which would be teaching, modeling, encouraging. You might want to call that discipling. But then there are times there, there's a need for correctional discipline, admonishing and rebuking. I will do that regularly with you in a public setting. I mean, many times someone will come up to me after a Sunday sermon and say, Ronnie, today you stopped preaching and you started meddling. And I get what they're saying. You know, if you read the Bible, if you teach the Bible, there are going to be points in Scripture that encourage us and there are going to be points in Scripture that admonish us and rebuke us. Let me walk through three case studies that you'll read about in Scripture. The first one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I can guarantee that there's no one in this room that would list 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as one of their favorite sections of Scripture. But it is Scripture, and it does not need to be jettisoned or overlooked. Here it is, beginning verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality, notice the next two words, among you. This is important. This is not somebody who used to be among you and says, you know, I'm out of here. This is someone who uh, wants to be a part, claims to be a part of among you. And it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Now, Paul says this is a kind of perversion that's not even tolerated in an anything-goes Corinthian culture. And it's taking, you know, this is some pretty creative sinning that's going on here in Corinth. And this is not some one-time event where somebody did something really stupid, and then they're broken, and they're humble, and they apologize, and confess, and turn, and it's not that. This is something that's, it's a scandal. It's ongoing. It's public, it's rebellious, it's in your face. But there's another scandal that's going on, and it's the scandal of indifference. Because it, it feels like nobody cares or no one has courage enough to say anything. Verse 2, and you're proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who's been doing this? Now, if that sounds harsh to you, remember, there are steps that are taken before you get to that point. But Paul says, this one is already way down the pike here. This is public. It is stubborn. It's unrepentant. It is bold. It's significant. And I have an idea that perhaps some there in that Corinthian church had confused unconditional love with unconditional approval. Unconditional love is not unconditional approval. And the writers of the New Testament considered loving but courageous admonishment for a misbehavior in the family of God to be standard operating procedure. He, he doesn't say just ignore it and hope it'll, it will go away. And so, verse 3, for my part, even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who's been doing this. So when you are assembled and I'm with you in spirit, 
and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Notice that last phrase. This is so very important. The goal here is restoration. The goal here is hope. The goal here is for this person to get a wake-up call and run back in humble uh, penitence to the Lord. Now that phrase, hand over to Satan, I think it just simply means let this person go their way. I know of a situation where in a marriage, the husband was involved in an affair. The wife pleaded with him to come back, come to his senses. He wouldn't, and she said, I love you, but I'm letting you go. Have you ever tried to control the behavior of another person? That's a dead end street. You can encourage, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can show the water. You can, you can describe how good it tastes. You can take a drink yourself and get that refreshing look on your face. But you can't make that person. And as much as they might love this person here in the city of Corinth, you need to let them go. In the story of the prodigal son, that father ran to meet a son who was coming home. But he had no illusions that he could keep that rebellious son from leaving home. He was determined to do what he was going to do. And again, the goal here is restoration and renewal. And he says, you're boasting, verse 6, it's just not good. I don't know what they were proud of. Proud of their, uh, maybe like it says elsewhere in the Bible, they, they, they had confused grace as a license for immorality. But he says, church, your boasting's not good. And now he's going to use a little illustration from the Old Testament Passover uh, feast where the Israelites would clean out the home of, of leaven. Leaven was a symbol of, uh, of sin. And he says, don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you might be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, gang, when you treat sin lightly, you're treating the atonement lightly. You're treating what Christ has done for us and purchasing for us our salvation and redemption and identity as his bride, the church. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now listen to this, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or people of this world who are greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, or slander, a drunkard, or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? But are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. But expel the wicked person from among you. He says right here and right in your midst, you have a kind of bold, open immorality going on that doesn't even exist among the pagans in Corinth. And you're doing absolutely nothing about it. And you need to. And I believe they did. If you read the next letter, 2 Corinthians, in chapter 2, I believe it describes this very uh, man who I believe uh, humbled himself, returned, and was forgiven beautifully by the church. Um, but the body of Christ does not honor Jesus 
when a rebellious lifestyle that's grossly incompatible with the message of Christ is ignored. And righteous judgment is the simple recognition that something is obviously wrong in an ongoing way and, and asking then how might I respond to this in a redemptive way because that's the goal, redemption and restoration. Um, it's not a pleasant thing. But when people who have a relationship and something is amiss, when they begin to not play games and they say, look, there's, we have to acknowledge that uh, you're not walking in a healthy way with the Lord right now. Do you have courage to confront, to care front? Do you care enough to say, I am my brother's, my sister's keeper? And again, the goal here, let me put two words on the screen. Restoration. This is not vengeance. This is not anger. Not making anybody an enemy. It's restoration and protection. You know, every church elder, every Bible class teacher, anybody who's going to be a leader in the church, you, can't, you cannot be naive. As we went through the book of Acts, you remember the Apostle Paul warning the elders in the church in Ephesus, watch over your flock. There will be wolves in sheep's clothing, and you must pay attention. Don't let predatory behavior go unchecked. Don't let divisive behavior go unchecked. Do not let false doctrine go unchecked. Restore and protect. Now very quickly, another uh, scripture, and this is Jesus talking about this very topic in Matthew chapter 18. Now if you're familiar with the Gospel of Matthew, it, it's really a collection of six teaching segments from Jesus. Now the book opens with, his book, with the birth narrative and certainly concludes with the story of the cross and the resurrection, but in the Gospel of Matthew, there are six major discourses, teaching segments. In chapter 18, it's all about life in the church. Jesus is teaching us about life in the church. And he says this, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. That's step one. 95% of issues can be handled that way. But if they will not listen to you, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. That's a, a picturesque way of saying our relationship cannot continue the way it used to be. You're going to treat them with courtesy, not treat them as an enemy but they need to realize that there's something here between us. And notice, as Jesus teaches this, he says, there needs to be a due process, no rush uh, uh, when you're uncertain of facts. You, you, wanna, you wanna have facts. You wanna go to that person one on one, and you may need to do that more than once. And if, and if that's not helpful, then you go with two or three others again the goal is clarification and restoration and help and ministry now we live in a day where you have a church on every corner what often happens in churches is where if uh if you want to admonish me and i don't like it i just say you know what i think i'll just start going to that church on that corner because you really have no jurisdiction over me uh, beyond, this, uh, beyond this group, beyond this gathering. But here Jesus says, if you see a brother or sister, you know, some translations might say they sin against you, but really it's just you see a brother or sister living in an ongoing way where they need help and restoration, would you get involved and do so as quietly as possible? and as respectfully as possible. And then one more scripture, Galatians 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, 
You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. The idea here is of a broken bone, and you're going to restore that broken bone. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Okay, let me sort of tie a bow on some of these uh, uh, scriptures, and let's talk about care fronting here in 2022. First of all, a community of grace must have strong boundaries and strong leaders. I've been here a long time since we started, and I hope you have great respect for the people who've served in this church, for example, in the role of elders. 90% of what they do, you never see and never know about. But this church has been blessed with the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This church has been blessed with healthy ministry because we've had a cocoon over us of godly shepherds and elders who have boundaries. You know, we have doctrinal statements, we have church values. And, and those shepherds honor those values, they protect you, and they lead well. And a community of grace has to have those boundaries and strong leaders. Secondly, a community of grace examines itself honestly and quickly. <laughs> Before I'm going to examine anyone else, well, I've got to look first in the mirror right here at Ronnie, because a healthier church begins with me. A purer church begins with me. What's that old song? It's not my brother, it's not my sister standing in the need of prayer. No, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so a community of grace, we examine ourselves honestly and quickly, and we're ready to make those adjustments. I hope you'll be the kind of person who you welcome teaching. I hope you'll be the kind of person where you welcome, if if you're off base a little bit, you would welcome admonishment that you'd not be too proud to receive that. I hope you'll be the kind of person you're quick to repent, you're quick to apologize, and you're not going to be the kind of person that says, you're going to have to twist my arm behind my back and press me to the mat. No, we want to have that spirit that says, Lord, I'm open, I'm teachable, I'm, and, and where there's a blind spot or a stubborn streak, I'm ready to be softened by the Holy Spirit. And a community of grace, thirdly, does not quickly condemn. Uh, We're not just looking to to condemn, but a community of grace does not blandly condone either. We don't want to engage in the scandal of indifference. Some of you have watched the uh, TV show, the reruns, Hogan's Heroes. And there's the character on there, Sergeant Schultz. And you remember his famous lines, I see nothing, I know nothing, I hear nothing. The scandal of indifference, I don't want to be involved. But Cain, where is your brother? Where is your sister? And next, a community of grace follows the Jesus process. Rather than talking to everybody first, we go to that person, one-to-one, to be a redemptive person. Uh, help. And last of all, a community of grace aims to restore and aims to protect. And we do want to restore. And, you know, if, if you're around any group for a long period of time, as Galatians 6 1 says, some of you might be caught up in a sin. And it might become obvious, and, and you might be a little resistant. But the Bible says, you don't want to condone, neither do you want to condemn. You want to be engaged and involved and help restore, restore. You know, years ago, I've told some of you the story before. Martha and I, we were off the, we were in Fort Myers, Florida. We decided to have a little fun one afternoon. We uh, uh, rented a a wave runner and I had it for 30 minutes, and we get out off the coast, we're having fun, and all of a sudden the engine stops, and try to get it started again, (laughs) couldn't get it started, and so that thing just tips over, and so we we fall off, and we start trying to get back up on that uh, wave runner, and um, it's it's hard to do, 
And, uh, but, you know, we, we made it up, tried to start it up again. It wouldn't start, so it just tips over again. And um, so we'd ridden for about five minutes, but we spent the next 25 minutes bobbing up and down like shark bait out there off the coast of Fort Myers, Florida. And uh, finally, you know, the guy who's running the Wave Runner uh, um, uh, business, he comes by on his and he says, hey, your time's up. Come on in. I thought, well, I'd love to. I'd love to come on in. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to get back up on this Wave Runner, you know, hit the button, have it start, and come right back in. I can't get up. And if I can get up, I can't get it started again. I don't need advice from a distance. I need some help. And brothers and sisters, the very first step you take, you see something amiss in one another. Don't be quick to condemn. Don't say, I see nothing, I know nothing, I hear nothing. Rather, help to restore with a spirit of gentleness. Help that person get back up on that wave runner. Help that person, you know, turn that key, press that button, and start back up again. And you know what? There are various approaches you can take. Sometimes you're dealing with a brother or sister and there's something amiss. You know, the softest approach is what I would just call a fellowship approach. And this is where you just call somebody up and just say, hey, Ronnie, how you doing? Um... What's going on in your world? Uh, grab a cup of coffee one day. That's it. It's just a, you just trust the Holy Spirit to take that conversation in a, in a good way. Uh, the second approach is just the information approach. And this has a little more of an edge to it. This is where you say, hey, Ronnie, I've, I've, I've kind of lost track and uh, uh, just wondered what's up in your world. And I might be a little off base here, but let me just sort of ask, how are you doing spiritually? these days and uh, how would you say your spiritual um, temperature is and is there anything I can help with is there anything I can pray about for you and then a third approach is just that clear and direct approach the biblical illustration of this would be Nathan going to David and saying David let's not play games we both know what's going on and you are the man. And David listened and repented. And sometimes it's a very appropriate to have a conversation and just say, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think things are well. And may I just ask you, what does the high road look like for you now? And what does following Jesus look like for you? this week and under the umbrella of the Holy Spirit no one wants that person restored more than the Lord but you are that person's instrument and so guard your own soul yes but also have that spirit where you're going to help guarding the souls of those around you so my friend do you know a brother or sister right now to whom you can be a source of refreshment, encouragement? Do you have a brother or sister in your life right now that might need a word of admonishment as well? And let me just ask you, how are you? How are you doing? You know, there's that old song, we're prone to wander. We are. We're prone to wander. I've told you before about that guy who said, you Christians are always talking about revival why don't you people just get revived and stay revived and I said well why don't you just take a shower and get clean and stay clean here's why you can't just take a shower get clean and stay clean because you walk around in a dirty world that's why and as believers we need ongoing points of renewal revival that's why we do it every that's why we gather on Sundays it's that weekly opportunity to be revived and refreshed. That's why we take the Lord's Supper. It's a reminder of our cleansing and his promise to us to forgive us and our promise to him to honor him.